now we can start module five. So module five, we're gonna talk about computer arithmetic. Specifically, we are focusing on integers. We have 5b module, which talks about floating point. So we start, start with integer arithmetic, and then we move to floating point arithmetic. Um, it's from chapter three of the book. So we are finally done with chapter two. We're in chapter three of uh, Computer Organization and Design, Patterson and Hennessy, and I use some of the slides from Ron DeMora still. Um, yeah, as I said, we have two parts. We have arithmetic operations, we have floating point operations. So we're almost a month, yeah, less than a month, uh, done with the class. I'm probably gonna have, starting next week, you pretty much know everything about the fundamentals of computer architecture. And we're gonna spend the next two, three months after that, going deep into a little bit more advanced topics. Uh, even with this module, I try to cover some of the things that you we don't usually cover in introductory courses, like intro to complete architecture. So we have the mix of both of these guys, especially when it comes to floating point. We talk about the hardware implementation in more details, which is something we don't usually do in introductory courses. You guys are lucky because last year, when I taught this course, I actually asked them to implement some of these blocks using Verilog, and they had a lot of trouble doing it. So that's one of the reasons I decided to not do it this year. Uh, although I, I think that there are, there's a lot to learn when you go into this kind of challenging projects. Uh, but we're going to define projects that are more, uh, is, that are better suited for your uh, knowledge and capability. Most of you guys are computer scientists here, so that's why we changed the project a little bit. If you want to do computer engineering and hardware design project, you can always come to our lab and I can define some projects for you if you don't like to uh, have this type of project and find alternatives for you but I highly doubt that people want to do it, because those are way more challenging. So although we're not going to do any kind of actual implementation here, we're going to get familiar with the hardware that is doing the arithmetic for us in our computer systems. So the block that is responsible for implementing arithmetic operations in a computer system is in the computer architecture is called arithmetic and logic units. So its name is clear. It has it takes care of arithmetic operations and logic operations. But today we're going to talk about the arithmetic operations. What kind of operations we're talking about? We're talking about add, add immediate, subtraction, multiplication, division, and when it comes to the logic instructions, we have and, or, and so on. So for logic instructions, it's pretty straightforward because we already have logic gates for them. So if we want to do, for example, a bitwise OR, we use OR gates. If we want to use a bitwise AND, we use AND gates. So we literally have these simple gates designed inside the ALU for this kind of logical operations. But if you want to do arithmetic operation, we also need to use the same logic gates in a way that handle those operations for us. So we're not going to talk about logic gates in this class because there's a logic design course that talks about how logic gates work. So coming to this session, I assume that you guys are familiar with the AND gate, OR gate, XOR gate, and how they work. The truth table for them, I'm going to remind them whenever it's needed, I'm going to, I'm going to bring back the truth table, but my assumption is that you're already familiar with how AND, OR, XOR, XOR works. Okay, so ALU has a data path. The data path is from one register to another register. So we start from the register file and we go back to the register file. The RS and RT, so this is the encoding part, right? So we have the RS and RT in the encoding. 
These are the registers when we read them from the register file. So you guys are familiar with the register file at this point. We have the addresses, we send the address, we read the content, the content is 32 bits. So we get the content of the register coming out of the register file. And those are in two registers, RS and RT, first source and second source. Okay, so the third source and second source go to the ALU. This is just for the R-type instruction. If we had I-type instructions, we just had one of them, we had RS, and then we had a number. Okay, so we're not talking about it now, but when we actually go to the CPU, you can see how the I-type and R-type instructions are handled. So in this module, it's safe to assume that we are just talking about R-type instructions, okay? So we have two inputs, RS and RT, and then we have an output register. When we start from one register and we go back to another register, this, this path is called data path. Then it starts from the register and is stored back to the register. Then we have a control path, and there are other parts of the encoding we use for control path. For example, function, opcode. Those are the parts that we use for the control path. Uh, for example, in this case, because we're just talking about the R type, as I said, the control pass is defined based on the function field. Okay, we have six bits. It means that we can have 64 different functions implemented in the ALU. And we can choose, based on what type of instruction we want to run, we can choose what part of the hardware we want to activate. As a reminder, when we have a basic instruction, we have a hardware design actually has a real estate. It has space in the chip. It occupies some area on the chip. So when we have a basic instruction like add, it means that we have to design an adder in the arithmetic and logic unit. And then we have a function field that controls the path, activates that part of the chip, and now adder starts working. So only that part starts consuming power. We dissipate power. This is how the power dissipation happens. Okay, so we dissipate power because we're actually doing some computation. These switches are turning on and off. Okay, so what is, if we go to different design layers, we have gate level design, but inside the gates we really have transistors. So when we dissipate power, it means that these transistors are switching on and off, and there's some current, electrons are moving from one side to another side, and that means we are consuming power. Voltage with the multiplied by current, is equal to power. So that's how things happen. Because it's not an electronic circuit course, I'm not going to go all the way to the transistor, although I can. A lot of the papers that they publish are at that level, that level. But we don't want to talk about transistor level C, most transistors have, how they work, how they consume power. But for now, just have it. We have a function field. It chooses a part of the chip. Switches start turning on and off. And then we dissipate power. OK? This happens in any other so control path is coming from function field, so we get the input from the function field, but we also have some flags, like zero, like overflow, you can see the zero flag, overflow flag. These are the ones that are used to control different parts of the other parts of the design. So one example, branch instruction, branch equal, okay? So how do you think we handle branch in the ALU? We have T0 and T1. We want to see if T0 and T1 are equal. Then we want to change the program counter. We talked about in the last session that there is a multiplexer. If you remember, we said there's a multiplexer. We calculate both PC plus 4 and the target address. And that multiplexer is going to choose whether we're going to go to the next line or we want to jump to the target. Right? This is what we have. So this is also moving forward. Have this in mind. Everything is very connected. That's one of the reasons I went back and started from the basic concepts, because we want to connect everything, we want to build up, okay? So, last session we had a multiplexer, we calculated the PC plus 4 and the, P and the target address. And I, at the time I told you to don't worry about how we choose this multiplexer work. Now I can tell you, we have a register T0 and a register T1. When we want to see if they're equal, we just subtract, we have an activate the subtraction part of the ALU, and we subtract T0 and T1. If the answer is zero, it means that they're equal. Okay, so what happens here is that 
we don't really need to read the output of the ALU because we don't care about the result. We just care if it's zero or not. For that reason, there's another flag. When we do the subtraction, we don't want to know the result of the subtraction. We just want to know if they're equal to zero or not. So because of that, we have a zero flag. If the result of a subtraction, if the result of an addition, if the result of the multiplication, the zero flag doesn't care. When the result of your operation is zero, this is zero, the flag is going to be one. This one is going to control different parts of this design. That multiplexer that was supposed to choose between PC plus four and the target address is controlled by the zero flag. Okay. And then we have overflow flag, the errors that you get when you're programming your code. Some smart compilers actually return and they say you have overflow. Okay, you have overflow issues. Okay, so this is the flag that they're gonna use. They check and see if there's an overflow happening in your computation, then, then the, this flag is set and you have an idea where the problem is. So that's what it is used, that's overflow flag is used here. Okay, so now review of the binary arithmetic. It's exactly like decimal arithmetic. Nothing changes, we just have a different range. In a decimal arithmetic we have zero to 10, in binary arithmetic, we have 0 to 1, that's it. The same idea of carrying, if we add 6 and 7, the result is 13. We carry 1 and put 3 at the result, right? It's the same exact story here. We just have a different range, okay? So because we have a different range, we have different cases too. For example, if I want to add two numbers, two decimal numbers, I can have 50 cases, 0 plus 1. 1 plus 2, 3 plus 7, right? All different cases that I can get. In binary, I just have 0 plus 0 equals 0, 0 plus 1 equals 1, 1 plus 1 is equal to 1, 0, so I have a carry of 1. That's it. Okay, so it's basically decimal arithmetic, but simpler. Okay? The fun part is, because we don't have too many cases, because this arithmetic is simpler than decimal arithmetic, we can actually implement them with basic gates. For example, the sum operation can be done by XOR. The multiplication can be done by AND. Okay? An AND gate can actually multiply two bits. Zero multiplied by one is zero. Zero multiplied by zero is zero. One multiplied by one is one. Simple AND gate, but this is supporting the entire multiplication at the binary level. And everything that happens in the processor is binary, okay? So these are by choice. These are design choices that have been made in the past 70 years to have some kind of binary arithmetic. We don't have limitations on having, for example, multiple levels. We don't have to have 0 or 1. Don't think that we have to have switches that only work with 0 and 1. There are other logics too. There are electronic components that can support multiple levels. Actually, there are many research groups that actually work on this type of arithmetic. So these are design choices that have been made to have made this binary. And the simplicity gives us benefits like implementing the entire arithmetic with a simple gate. So if we add two numbers, these are some examples. Simply we add one and zero, we carry zero. When we have one and one, we carry one, and the same story is exactly like this. <coughs> Okay, now that was addition. If you want to do subtraction, still the same story. If you want to subtract these two bits, seven and six, you subtract every bit and that's what you get. Another way is you do the two's complement and you add them. Okay, you can just two's complement, you can add seven and negative six. So some of the, some, these are the things that we do at the hardware because it's more beneficial. I can explain to you why with some examples. So overflow, so let's talk about overflow a little bit. Overflow happens because we have hardware limitations, okay? We have registers that have 32 bits. So if I add two 32 bit number, the result is gonna be 33 bits. So right there, I don't have enough hardware, I don't have enough flip flops because we need one bit, we need one flip flop for every bit to support that 33 bits and then overflow happens. When I have a hardware limitation, when, when my arithmetic results go beyond 
my hardware you know, possibilities, then we have overflow. How can you test it? It's actually pretty straightforward. So if you have two, for example, positive numbers, non-negative numbers, and if you add them and the results become negative, it's a little bit weird, right? But that's because the sign bit is moved to the 33rd bit, okay? So your sign bit is not supposed to change. But when you have a big number, that one at the end that was supposed to be sign bit, now we have an overflow and your result is negative. Okay, so if you add two non-negative numbers and your result is negative, then you have an overflow. So any of you checks that. When, you're, when you want to run a sign operation, for example, in the beginning, it checks the sign of the bits, and at the end, it checks the sign of the output. And using this table that you see here, it activates the flag for the overflow. Okay, so same as story here. If you have two negative numbers, and if you add them, and you get a non-negative number, then that's an overflow. If you, if you have a subtraction, your A is non-negative, your B is negative, your result is negative, and again, it's an overflow, right? It's common sense. But there are hardware design in the ALU to do this, to make these checks for us, okay? So for on-sign operations, we don't care about overflow. So if everything is positive, is non-negative, you don't care about overflow. But what can happen is that you add two large number, numbers, and the result that you get can be smaller. Right? But that's a problem that you have to deal with yourself. Like in a lot of code that you create, that can happen. The overflow with the unsigned numbers is something that is not really handled in MIPS at least, MIPS processor. But you should, except for some scientific applications, if you're working with really large numbers, 32 bit supports a very large numbers. So for regular programs that we have, we don't usually face this problem. But if you do, then don't use this. Okay. Now let's talk about these adders and multipliers and so on. So today I think we have enough time to cover the adder part, and then we go to the other blocks, integer blocks. So the most basic adder that we can have, at least from my point of view, is a full adder. Full adder gets two bits, two inputs from the operand. So we have different bits of the operands A and B. So we get, for example, A0 and B0 here, and a carry. So it basically adds three bits, A, B, and carry, C. So if you have a truth table here, if you add these three bits, for example, if I add 0, 0, and 0, the result is going to be 0, 0. And if I add, let's say, for example, these two numbers, 1, 1, 0, the result is going to be 2. So my carry is going to be 1, the sum is going to be 0. Right? So, and on this side, we're adding these three bits. On the right side, we have two bits to support every possible answer. When you have three bits, you can get if you add three bits, you can get anything from zero to three. So it means that you need two bits to support that zero to three number. Okay. So S is going to be your sum, and carry out is what you use here. That's going to be connected to the carry in of the next full adder if you want to have multi-bit operations. So you can simply connect these one-bit full adder designs to get n bit addition. So in this case, we have four of them, we get four bit. Okay, but how do we implement that? We have two XOR gates. So these two XOR gates become XOR A and B, as you can see here, and then XOR the result we see in, we get the sum. Again, this is logic design, so I'm not gonna go over how we can do this current table and so on. For C out, we have a, B plus C, N, A, X, or B. So we get A, X, or B, and and it with C, N, and then we have and of A and B, and then we have an OR gate here. Okay, so for one bit full adder, we need five gates, two XORs, two ANDs, and one OR. It's a very simple design. Okay, we 
can concatenate them, you can just connect the carry out of one bit for ladder to carry in of the other one to get multi-bit operation, to get multi-bit addition. Okay, very simple. So how many gate delays do we have here? Can you guess how many gate delays? So this so advantage of this is low gate count. We just need five gates. This advantage is the propagation delay. It takes some time to go from input to output. So if you assume that every gate, so right now our assumption that the same takes the same amount of time for AND to finish this operation as XOR, for example. This is not an accurate assumption, but it's good enough. So let's say we have specific gate delay, average gate delay. So how many gate delays do you think I have in this circuit to go from input all the way to get all of my results, both C and S? I can, I can start with one. We have one gate delay here to get the input here. And now you take it from there. Three. Regina is saying five, you're saying three. Who says the five is the right answer? And who thinks three is the right answer? Okay, so why three? So the maximum time it will take is to see how to be fully propagated. Yeah. And <clears throat> so, C out depends on the second layer, and the second layer depends on the first layer. That's right. That's right. So, for to get the output for both of these cases, C out and S, C out is the bottleneck, right? So, with S, we can have two XORs and all the inputs. So, we assume that we have the inputs ready. By two gate delays, we get S. But for C out, we need three gate delays, right? We need an XOR. Then we have to wait for the result of the XOR, then we do the AND. This one, we don't need to wait for the result of the XOR, but anyways, we have to wait for this AND. So both of these guys should remain here. And then we have an, we have an OR at the end. So how do you think we deal with these timing issues? So this one is ready and the other one is not ready? We just wait. <laughs> as simple as that. So we have to calculate the propagation delay, and we don't sample the output. You just wait for enough time and then read the output. Okay, you apply the input. You don't have to do any kind of synchronization here. We do synchronize things at large scale, but not at the full at the scale. Okay, so you don't need to do any synchronization. You just need to wait for enough time. This is what defines your clock frequency, right? So if your clock frequency, we talked about it before too, now we're going back to two, three weeks ago. If the clock frequency is so fast that it doesn't give us give the circuit to complete this task, what we're going to sample is not going to be a correct operation. One of the ways that we want to we can calculate what should the frequency be, what should the clock cycle be, depends on how it's a, it's a concept called critical path. How long my critical path is. Critical path is the longest path from the input to output or the longest path and the data path. So you find the critical path, and you define the clock cycle based on the critical path. So you don't want to have any kind of violations. So now, let's have this question. You have, a, have been hired too late to do a layout design for ripple carry adder. So this adder is called ripple carry adder because it carry ripples from one full adder to another full adder. So you're supposed to design it for r type instructions, and uh, in a CPU with a 32-bit wide AOD, okay? But so you want to use one bit full adders using five Boolean gates, as you can see here. This is what we just talked about. So how many Boolean gates we need to design this ripple carry adder? We want to design a 32-bit adder using one bit full adders. How many Boolean gates do we need here? Let's go back to this one. How many Boolean gates do we need for four bit full adder? This guy. How many Boolean gates do we need for one bit full adder? How many do we need for four? How many do we need for 32? So 
we need 160 gigs to design a 32-bit full header. Now the more difficult question. If the gate delay is 50 picosecond, then in the worst case, how long would addition of two 32-bit numbers require using this carry header, triple carry header? So it means that if we have a gate delay of 50, we already talked about the gate delay of one bit full header. So if we have a gate delay of 50, how long does it take for this 32 bit full header to finish this operation? How many gate delays? We just talked about it. How many gate delays do we have for one bit full header? Three. Three. Okay, so let's start with that. This is the longest path, and we have three gate delays. What happens after this point? We're gonna have 32 of these guys connected to each other, right? A possible answer is 32 multiplied by 3, which means 96 gate delays, right? That's a possible answer. Do you agree with me? But there is something tricky happening here. Obviously, that possible answer is not the correct answer, right? But I was expecting at least one of you guys tell me the you know the obvious answer. Go with me. Uh, on your last operation, or on your last adder, you only carry out the S bit, so that would only have two gate delays in the last one. On the very last one? So that's the progress. You're getting there. But it's not completely true. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I had uh, 4.8 nanoseconds as what I... I, I don't know the final answer, so explain yeah. the process again. Okay. Well, that was just doing the, assuming you'd have the full delay for all of them. But then I was thinking, okay. you don't have to carry anything in on the first two bits. You don't have to carry anything out on the last bits, right? You don't have to carry anything in the first two bits. Yeah, okay. And then you don't need to carry in the last bit. I think in the last bit we have to do it. The carry oh, out, the we don't care yeah. about. What? The, the so last one, we don't care about the carry out, right? So that's what Mason was saying. Uh -huh. um, it is true and it's not true at the same time. So it's a little bit more, so let's, let's see. I'm, I wouldn't expect you to know the answer because it doesn't, it's not common sense. So we have three gate delays in the first one. But now we need C1 to calculate this X1, right? But we don't need carry from the first triple carry header to get to calculate the first XOR here. So this A1 and B1 is available. We already have the operands, right? We already have the A0 to A31 and B0 to B31. So that first XOR doesn't really need to wait to be calculated. Okay, so you can calculate this one. What it means is that after the first one, which means we have three gate delays, after that point, we just have two gate delays. This can be taken care of in parallel. It doesn't matter. We already have everything we need in the input of this gate. These are the delays that we have. This is why we have to wait for carry out of the first full adder to calculate the next bit. And then we have to wait for the carry out of this one to calculate the next bit. But these XORs, this gate delay, is done at the same time for all of them. So all the A0, B0, A1, B1, A2, B2, all these XORs happen right at the beginning of the same gate delay. The only thing that is not letting us to go all the way to calculate the sum and carry of every bit is this carry out of each full back, full adder. This export doesn't matter. Okay, so it means that after the first one, we just have two gate delays. So it's gonna be like this. 
you have 100 picosecond after the first bit, and we need 150 seconds for the first bit. Which is 150 plus 31 multiplied by 100. And this is what we get, 3.25 nanoseconds. Okay, this is the delay of the 32-bit adder. So it takes, if I ask you how long it takes for a full adder to finish its task using a ripple carry adder, but this information, 50 picoseconds, which is honestly not a really unrealistic number. So you can get, gates can actually work that fast. So three nanosecond is a reasonable number for a carry adder, ripple carry adder. So that's, the, how, that's how long it takes to finish a 32-bit number. Okay, so if I use this adder, it means that my clock cycle time, if I want to finish this in one clock, my clock cycle time should be more than 3.25 nanoseconds. Should be something around 4 nanoseconds. It means my clock frequency is something around 250 megahertz. The processes that we have these days are talking about a few gigahertz. So obviously there is something happening here. So we, I highly doubt that there's any good architecture right now that's actually used a ripple caddy adder. It's supposed to be take that long. Again, the carry is the problem. We have to ripple from one side to one, one adder to another adder. So what is the possible solution? We have another adder called carry look ahead adder. Okay, so carry look ahead is adding, this is the trade-off. Let me add a lot of gates. Let me calculate all the carries ahead of time at the cost of area occupation, at the cost of power consumption, but they calculate all the carries really fast, and then you don't depend the carry anymore, right? It significantly reduces your, your um, propagation delay. But it means they have to add, add more and more hardware. So how does it do it? It defines this signal called generate signal that is A and B. And then you have the propagate signal, it's called A, it's A or B, they call it PI. And CI plus one is equal to GI plus PI CI, okay? So what it means is that I need A and B, and not the carries, just A and B, to calculate G and P. And after that point, I can calculate all the C's, all the carries. It can be from C1 to C31. I can calculate all the carries by just having the offerings. That's it. A0 to A31, B0 to B31. So my carry doesn't depend, CI plus one doesn't depend on CI. It just depends on A0 and B0, AI and BI. Okay? So now for a four bit, this is how you can do it. But as you can see, it is easily getting bigger and bigger. So calculating C1, we just need an AND gate, and here we need another OR gate, an AND gate, and an OR gate. So with two OR gates and two AND gates, we can get C1, but then for C2, it's getting bigger. For C3, it's getting bigger. We can easily get out of control. We can have way too many gates for one adder. But it's pretty fast. The propagation delay is significantly smaller. It's called carry look ahead adder. So in reality, what people do is that they combine the idea of carry look ahead and ripple carry adder. How? For example, for something like this. If you want to do a 32-bit addition, we use four-bit carry look aheads, but then we use eight of them and ripple the carries. Okay, so you, instead of having 32-bit one adders, you get four, four, four bit carry look aheads. The gates are a little bit bigger, but then to calculate the next four bits, you need to get the input from this one. <coughs> but this can be way faster than having four one-bit full adders. So the idea is let's combine two different designs. Let's have four bit carry look aheads, and then use a ripple carry adder idea, but not on one bit, on four bit, four bit adders. Does that make sense? So this is called carry look ahead adder combined with the ripple carry adder. Okay, 
There is another one called, this one is pretty fast. It's like actually significantly faster. And you can see why. It's called carry select adder. So what it does is actually pretty clever, but it's, it's not efficient at all. So the bottleneck here is that I need to give the carry of the first group. Let's say we have an 8-bit something. I will separate this 8-bit adder to two 4-bit adders, okay? The bottleneck that I have here is that I have to calculate C4 before calculating the next 4 bits. So I have to calculate the first 4 bits, I have to wait for it to be done, and then calculate the next 4 bits. But what it is saying is that, okay, what is going to be the output of the C4? It's either 0 or 1. You might as well do the computation for both of them. So assume that you have a zero as the input, and then use another adder that does the same addition with the assumption that the carry is going to be one. So now these three guys finish their task at the same time. This is an adder, this is an adder, there's no dependency here. There's just one assumption that the input is zero, and then this one assumes that the input is going to be one, the carry is going to be one. When these guys are done, they're going to use a multiplexer. And based on the output of the C4, it's going to choose one of these answers. If the output is zero, it says, okay, let me read the one that I calculated for zero. But like this, there's an obvious bottleneck here. You're literally adding more adders. Like we have a complete full adder, four bit adder here, added to the system that you might not even use. So to do the four bit and the eight bit additions, we need three four bit full adders, four bit adders instead of two of them. The trade-off is clear. We add more data, we more real estate. Area occupation is more. It's not just area, we're actually doing the addition. The power consumption is more. So this way, 33% more, or 50% more, actually. But yeah, obviously, it's very fast. Just, it depends on your design requirements. OK. So this is the idea of the carry select adder. So in our design, so now let's talk about a very simple ALU that has a control bit. Let's say we have an ALU. Again, the idea is that we're building up, right? So we know what the adder is. Now we want to design an ALU that does addition and subtraction. Okay? Addition and subtraction with the same hardware. How can we do it? So that's why in the beginning when I was giving a review of the arithmetic, I said that there is one, one way that you can do the subtraction is using two's complement. So instead of actually designing hardware that takes care of the subtraction for you, you can reuse the same hardware that does addition. Your two's complemented, you go, if you want to have seven minus six, you add seven and minus six, negative six. So to get negative six, you have to do two's complement. Okay, so this is an idea that we use for the adder subtractor. We have a register A that is directly going to adder. And we have a register B that has a complementer. So this does a two's complement. It's in, it inverts every bit and add a one to it. This is how you do two's complement. You invert every bit and add it with one. Okay? So this is how it complements B. But then there's a switch that chooses between addition and subtraction. If it's an addition, it's going to pass B directly. If it's a subtraction, it's going to add the result of the two's complement to the adder. And then we have the overflow and so on. Does that make sense? Now with the same hardware, we added a little bit of switches, control you know, blocks like multiplexers and two's complement and so on. But we're going to change the adder structure. With that, we can also cover subtraction too. So now let's see how it works. Negating something, getting the invert of the bit, we can do it with x4. So x, if we have this a, x4 with 0, it's going to return xf. So we have x, x or 0, the output is going to be x. If we have x, x or 1, the output is going to be the invert of x. So x4 can work as a NOT gate based on the input that it has. If 
the input is zero, the output is it's not going to invert anything. If the input, if one of the inputs is one, it's going to invert the bit. Okay. So what we do here, we have an Anders subfactor signal, and this signal, if you want to do the addition, is going to be equal to zero. So we pass the B itself, and if it's equal to one, we're going to get the inverse of the B as input of the adder. <coughs> but inverting it is not enough because two's complement needs an addition with one and two. So we have to invert every bit and then add the result with one. What we do here, we also connect that signal to the carry bit, to the input carry of the adder. So if you use the XOR, you invert every bit and that one that you need to add to complete the two's complement operation can be done through the carry in of the full adder, of the adder. Does that make sense? Any questions? We have one come in here, invert every bit, add it with one, or two's complement and done. If the input is zero, you pass B, your input is zero too, so it doesn't matter if you add it with zero, you basically take care of the add operation. So now, with this information, let's see how it is done with the function field. So we're adding more blocks again. Okay, so we have an R-type instruction, you're familiar with this, and then we have a function field. We use a decoder, so a 6 to 64 decoder, as it works this way. If you have a 2 to 4 decoder, for example, uh, you have 2 bits, that 2 bits can represent any number from 0 to 3, right? And then on the output side, you have 4 terminals of the decoder. So if the input is 0, the zero terminal on the output is going to generate a one, and everything else is zero. If the input is one, one, or three, the bit three on the output is going to be one, and everything else is going to be zero. So decoder, the output of the decoder, always have one single one, and everything else is zero, depending on the input. Okay, if we have a six to 64 decoder, I can have any numbers from zero to 63, and my output chains are actually from 0 to 63. So if my input is 15, the terminal 15 is going to generate a 1, and everything else is going to be 0. That's a decoder. Okay, now I add this decoder to the system, and let's see how I use it. We have a decoder. We have an enable. This is just a tri-state buffer. I just throw it here for you to know. It's not that important. It's a buffer that just practically says, should I move the output to the register or not? And that's it. Okay. And then we have the add or subtract the circuit that we just talked about. XORs, carry, and so on. Now let's see we have an add operation. So the function field, if we check the reference sheet, when we have an add operation, the function, the decimal value in the function field is going to be 32. You see the hexadecimal, if you convert that, you're going to get 32. Okay. So if the input is 32, the output bit 32 is going to be 1, and everything else is 0. Right? That's how the decoder works. So now if I send the 0 and 1, the 0 and 1 go to the OR, the output is going to be 1. So it means that, OK, transfer the output, whatever you get. I don't care what you're doing, just move the result to outside. Now the, out, the input of this one is going to be 0, because this is going from bit 34. This one is going from 32. Because the input is 32, the pin 34 is going to be 0. So if I have 32, the pin 34 is 0. So this 0 goes here. When I X or something with 0, it's not going to change it. And then I have to carry a 0 as well. So I'm going to complete a, a, an addition operation. But if it's 34, then I have 1 here and 0 here, then all of these two is again, I'm going to get the output, but now 1 is going to go all the way to the input. 1 is going to invert every bit through the XOR that we see here, and we have the carry input which is 1, 2, so the 2's complement is done. And now if we do the addition, we're actually doing the subtraction. So this is how we can use a function field, this is how it can be used. I'm not saying this is actually used how it is used in the MIPS, 
but now you get an idea how those numbers, those values that we get in the machine code can be used to control the flow of data, the data path, okay? This is how this can be used. We use decoders, we use multiplexers, we use this kind of circuits and use those inputs to control our operation. This was the case for adder subtraction. Next session we're gonna talk about multipliers, divider, and so on. Okay, we're good for today.